Now, as we look at John chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. This was right before Jesus began uh, the week of passion, if you will. The last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And as he came back to Jerusalem, well, the, Jerusalem was packed. Remember, uh, Passover was coming. There was many pilgrims that would come in. And Jeru Jerusalem was just expanding. It's normally around 60 to 120,000 people. But during Passover, it would go up to 80,000 to 300,000 folks. You know, Saturday, you know, college footballs began. So think about Fayetteville or Norman or whatever team you root for in the hometown whenever they're having a hometown game. Okay? The place just explodes with people. It's crowded. It's overrun. So think of Jerusalem in that way, that it was just packed. It was overrun with people. But luckily, Jesus and his disciples knew some folks right outside of town in a small little town called Bethany. And he and his disciples went there uh, to stay with them for an evening meal. And you would recognize their names as Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so here they go to this meal that evening. But it wasn't just something, it, was, it just wasn't a normal meal. Something was about to take place that not only was a simple gesture of gratitude and respect, but a foreshadowing of events to come. The attendees at this dinner in honor of Jesus are about to witness something extravagant, something special, something unheard of, and something never seen before. So if you will, let's read in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a dinner there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So before we get going any further, let's think about who was in this room. You want to think about people who were popular, uh, people who had something to say about Jesus. Well, this was a room of some high-level folks, if you will, but very humble folks. You had Jesus and his 12 disciples, those 12 that had been following him for the past three years. We had Mary, which we had seen before that had been there at the house before. They were, they were good friends. We had Martha, who, if anyone knows anything about Martha, you know that people who just are so busy in hospitality and everything like that, those are Martha figures, right? We see Martha always working, always wanting to be hospitable to Jesus. But then we also see Lazarus, who three days before this was dead in a tomb. So we have a crowd of folks that each and every one of them had been affected by Jesus' ministry. From little to big, but every one of them had been affected by Jesus' ministry. So this morning, as we look at this passage and as we see who were there, the one thing I want us to see in the title of this sermon this morning is simply this, complete devotion. Do you have complete devotion for Jesus? Folks, there's a lot of things that can, people can be devoted to today. But our complete devotion needs to be on Jesus Christ. Let me give you a definition of devotion. Wholehearted commitment to God. Wholehearted commitment to God. And then we also look in the dictionary. If you will look up the word definition or the word devotion. You will find the words love and loyalty for a person, activity, or cause. And so when you think about this morning, what you, are, what you love and what you're loyal to, wholehearted commitment, what are you wholeheartedly committed to this morning? I want you to put that in the back of your mind and think about this while we study this passage this morning. So we see who's there and at this dinner, Martha was serving. That's no surprise, right? Martha's always being there, being the hospitable one. The disciples are there around the table. It says that Lazarus is there reclining at the table. 
I'm sure he was ready for a good old homemade meal after being dead for a few days. Amen? I know I would be. So Lazarus is there at the table. And here Mary says, Mary then took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard. Costly perfume. We're talking 300 denarii expensive. This was about a year's wage for a day laborer. Think about that. A year's wage all in one small bottle. It was a pound of spice. It was huge. It was lavish. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? We know that 200 denarii would have fed them. So this is 100 denarii more than that. And this, this nard, it was an oil extracted from an eastern Indian plant. It was pure, meaning it had no additives. And this was a very large amount of it. And we read here that Mary then took a pound of this very expensive perfume and anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, friends, anointing people at, 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 during this time period was, was common. But what happened here was not common. Taking that much, a whole pound of pure nard, and pouring it upon Jesus. Friends, a whole year's wage worth poured out upon him. Friends, Mary was showing complete devotion to Jesus. She laid it all out to him. It was a lavish display, a devotion to Jesus. Normally, to anoint someone, it was a few drops. But a few drops just wasn't enough for Mary to show how devoted she was to Jesus. She, she literally poured it all out from his head down to his toes. It was there. She anointed him. And it says that the entire house was filled with this fragrance. Man, if you're like me, you probably have had a wife that I sprayed perfume in the mornings, and it just lingered all day long. I know that's when you know you bought her the good stuff, right? Is when it lingers all day long. I know my wife, she sprayed some in the mornings, and I was like, you know, it almost choked me. It smelled good, but it was just so strong. And I'd come home from work, and there I could smell it still. It was just lingering. And here it says the smell of this pure nard filled the entire room. You know, I've also read in places that as she anointed Jesus and the smell was strong, that as he went through his last week, as he went day after day and as he was being beaten and scourged by the cat of nine tails, that through the, the smell of the, the, the sweat and the blood, he could also still smell the smell of this pure nard that he had been anointed with. Remembering that complete devotion. Remember, the disciples bailed on him, didn't they? They were not there. They left. And so that smell, that aroma, would have been a comfort to the Lord. Friends, she poured it out all out, not keeping any for a rainy day. But not only that, it says that she got down and wiped his feet with her hair. Now we can read over that thing, well, that's strange. But during this time period, women did not let their hair down in public. And, and their hair was an ornament of beauty. And Mary being there, she was at the feet of Jesus once again, and she let her hair down and got down on her knees. And she took her hair and started wiping his feet with it. And you know what that means, church? She was literally putting it all out to him. Literally, even her beauty was in devotion to Jesus Christ. She didn't care about social protocols. She didn't care what other people thought about her. All she cared about was Jesus knowing and understanding how much she loved him and how much she was loyal to him. It was worth everything to her. Romans 12, 11 tells us, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Friends, 
Are you lacking in zeal this morning for the Lord? Ask the Lord to provide you with that love, with that passion, with that zeal for him once again. Because the days are, are, are getting very, very close to Jesus coming back again. And we need to be sure that we're showing our complete devotion to him, that the world sees it, that the world knows it. It's time to pour it all out. Do you give Jesus everything that you have or are you holding some back? You see, each believer has received spiritual gifts. They're not meant to be hoarded, but rather used to further the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter 4.10, it states, as each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Are you using what God has gifted you with to further the kingdom of God? Because if we have these gifts and we say, well, I've, I've served my time, I've done it, it let, let someone else do it. Friends, that's hoarding your spiritual gifts. And that is not what God has called us to do. He's called us to put it all out and to use them to further his kingdom. Friends, we are to have complete devotion to the Lord. Complete. You know, what do I mean by, by complete, complete love, complete loyalty? Well, I'm going to pick on the men here again, all right? You women okay with that? If I pick on the men for a minute? I figured you would be, all right? But men, I, I know just in growing up in western Oklahoma, there is one thing that most men are very, very loyal to, and that is the brand of their pickup trucks. <laughs> all right? Either a Ford, Chevy, or Ram guy. And there's really no crossing over. There's really no, well, I drove this, now I'm driving that. They're focused on their one truck. And my dad, he's a Ford guy through and through. You bleed him, he, he bleed Ford blood, okay? Uh, and I even asked him one day, listen to this. I asked him one day, I said, Dad, I know you're loyal to Ford. I know you've driven their pickups for years. But if they came out with a pickup, that was the ugliest pickup you've ever set your eyes on. Would you still buy one? And he said, of course. <laughs> Friends, that is loyal, right? That is loving and loyal. Why can't we be that, that way with Jesus? No matter what he puts in our lives, no matter what we have going on, we are completely sold out and part of his will. And no matter what happening, we're 100% in it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing's going to change our minds. Nothing's going to make us waver. But we're all in 100%. Friends, that is having a complete devotion to Christ. We're to pour it all out. So friends, don't let those who misunderstand what a Christian is keep you from serving God the way you've been called to serve Him. Because when you live for Christ, others are not going to understand. Others will disagree. And we see this with Judas during this meal. So if you will, read with me in John 12, verses 4 through 6. It says, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who intended to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the proceeds given to the poor people? Now he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he kept the money box, he used to steal from what was put into it. Friends, think about that. Every time we see Judas in scriptures, he is prefaced with the one that betrayed Jesus. He was a thief. He was a liar. He's the one that stole out of the money box. It's never good. And so in this story, let me highlight this. There's Four main characters, okay? One, we have Jesus. We have Mary. We have Judas. And I'm also going to throw in Lazarus there, even though he's just mentioned and he's sitting at the table. Because listen, if you are a born-again believer in this room, Christ has brought you back from the grave. 
you are born again. So each and one of you, every one of you in here is a Lazarus already, right? You were dead in your trespasses. Behold, the new has come. And so you are alive in Christ, just as Lazarus was. But are you devoted as Mary or as Judas? Mary poured it all out. Judas, on the other hand, he sat and judged the one that was fully devoted. He placed that judgment. He looked down his nose at her. He threw out these critiques, saying, well, this could have been used to feed the poor. Have you all ever been hit with that? You aren't able to do something for someone, and so they said, well, you're a Christian. You should do this. They try to make you feel guilty by using the, the Bible and some scriptures to support it. Friends, Mary in no way when she poured this out was saying that she did not believe in taking care of the poor. What she was doing was showing her complete devotion to Christ who called her to do that very thing. Judas, though, he was the judge. He saw it as a complete waste. We can, we can be quick to judge the judge, can't we? We say, man, he's... He's rotten. But before we do that, let's, let's think to ourselves a little bit. Let's think about what we may say is a waste. You know, I know growing up, I used to hear uh, about not wasting food, okay? Getting too much on your, on your plate and you don't eat it and you throw it away, that's never a good thing, right? You, we we want to teach kids and, and as adults, we don't want to waste food. I know back in the 80s, 90s, it may even be said still today, you know, you always heard this phrase, son, do not waste that food. They're starving kids in China. I remember saying that. Yeah. You know, as I got older, I started thinking about that phrase, thinking, well, box it up and mail it to them. You know, it's not going to be any good by the time it gets there. But we, we see that as a waste, right? We don't want to waste food. And so we tried to put a guilt trip on our kids so they wouldn't do that anymore. But coming a little closer to home and in a lot of different churches, you know, as technology has expanded, we've seen projectors, screens, TVs, and technology. In the beginning, they were seen as almost a waste in the church. People didn't want to spend the money on them. But they have since helped further the kingdom of God in one way or another. Ivan once worked with a lady that thought buying any form of t-shirt was a complete waste of God's money. Whether it was for camp, uh, VBS, mission trips, you name it, it's a complete waste of money. And I had to tell her, I said, ma'am, with, no, you know, with much due respect here, I know it seems like a waste of money, but t-shirts are a walking billboard of Jesus Christ and what, what you're doing. You know, I, I still... Where's Brother Zach? I know he has a shirt that says, ask me about Jesus. I mean, you can see that thing a mile away. And I remember, and I'm a believer, right? So if I ever need to know a question about Jesus, I'm asking Zach. You know, it's just how it works. So they were not a waste. Spending money on children's camp and youth camps, baptism, special events. Friends, these aren't a waste, are they? They're meant to further the kingdom of God to engage people, to connect with people. I always tell folks, methods change, but the message of Jesus Christ remains the same. We may not do this, things the same way we did 30 years ago, but the message is exactly the same. We're still sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then when we think about what we have to offer Christ, in, in, in seeing people worshiping and, and what they're doing. Friends, we need to be very careful not to judge others for the way they show their devotion to Christ. Especially in worship. Friends, if you feel led to raise your hands in worship, raise your hands in worship. Okay? Don't worry about the person next to you if they seem like they're judging you, looking down their nose at you. Don't worry about them. That's between them and God. This is between you and the Lord. Show your devotion the way the Lord's leading you to show your devotion to God. Because friends, as much as I hate to say this, there's always going to be your Judases in the world. There's always going to be the Judases. But we're called 
as 1 Timothy 4.12 says, to not let anyone look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Show others how to be a devout Christian. Show others what it looks like to put everything out there. Give everything to the Lord. Galatians 1.10 states, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. These are the words of the Apostle Paul to the church of Galatia. If anyone knew about being judged, it was the Apostle Paul. But he continued to do what he was called to do, understanding he was not in it to please men, but only to please God. So whenever we are doing what we're called to do, and someone wants to throw out a judgment at you and make you feel guilty for not doing this or doing that, remember what the Lord has said to you. Don't be blinded by the words of the enemy. Don't, be, don't feel guilty for showing devotion to the Lord. Friends, as Judas objected to this, it was with a very evil intent. That's why Scripture tells us about him. Because if we hadn't said that, we thought, well, we really need to feed the poor. You know, don't, don't give it to Jesus. Let's give it to the poor. But it says here specifically that he intended to betray Jesus and that he didn't really care about giving it to the poor, but he wanted the money for himself. He was a thief. Friends, the enemy is a thief as well. The devil is a thief and a liar. And when you start pouring out your complete devotion to him, guess what's going to happen? He's going to rear his ugly head and he's going to try to convince you and make you feel guilty for not doing this or doing that or not spending money over here instead of spending over there. Whatever it is, be sure not to fall for those lies. How often do people make judgments that are backed by a heart and intention of pridefulness and self-centeredness? You know, it is easy to make a statement about the Lord, about the church, about Christianity, to make oneself look good. But friends, talk is cheap. Anyone can say things. And this objection from Judas is not focused on Jesus at all. It's more focused on worldly goods and materials. It was clothed in good deed, but is composed of sinful desire. And it comes down to the attitude of the heart. Mary's heart was focused on worshiping her king. Judas' heart was focused on making his pockets even bigger with money. We are to take care of the poor, but we also are to glorify Jesus. Is it wrong to have a beautiful church, a pristine and clean sanctuary, a church campus that is clean and well manicured. Not at all. Friends, on the contrary, you can tell how much a church loves God by looking at their building, by, by how well it's been taken care of. You can tell the heart of a church by the way it looks inside and out. You know, if I pulled up to a church and see it's just all grown up, graffiti on the walls and everything else, that church obviously doesn't really care much about the building that they have for the Lord's worship time. You can also go inside and look at the nursery. Growing churches have growing nursery departments. Now, I'm so thankful for Miss Lori and what she's done here, and I know if you go knock on the door, she's going to look at you and say, you can't come in. So I'm thankful for that. But I know our nursery is full right now. Many little ones in there. Because this church is growing. God is blessing us, and I praise God for that. So church, there is time to sell the nard and minister to those in need. 
but there's also a time that one is able to bring the full jar of nard to the Lord and use it to honor Jesus. So Judas showed that judgment to him, showed it to her. Mary showed devotion. Judas judged her devotion, but Jesus approved her devotion. If you look at verses 7 through 8, it says, Therefore Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, Jesus must have felt grief towards the way the disciples were reacting to this event. Jesus must have also felt an overwhelming gratitude towards the loving act of Mary. When we read about the disciples, they have trouble understanding who Jesus was and misunderstanding his teachings. They, they, they fall away. They don't quite get it. Peter you know, sticks his foot in his mouth all the time. They have very a, a great amount of difficulty of really coming to grasp of who Jesus was. But every time we look at this Mary, every time this Mary is mentioned, she is at the feet of Jesus. In Luke 10, 39, it says, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Then in John eleven thirty two, 32, therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, at the feet of Jesus. So my question today, in who are you in this story? Are you a Mary or are you a Judas in your devotion? Where is your devotion at? Are you at the feet of Jesus? Or are we misunderstanding? Are we being judgmental? Or are we being like the disciples? Or do we understand the heart of God and are bringing to him all that we are and all that we have? Are we judging others' actions towards the Lord or are we considering our own actions? Friends, Jesus' reaction is very strong against Judas's critique. Mary was to have kept this perfume for a special time, a special moment, and guess what? That special time had arrived. She understood. She got it. It clicked. A light bulb came on. It had been kept to prepare Jesus figuratively for burial. Because this was a burial spice. And she poured it all out. Friends, what do we do for Jesus our actions, our deeds, our good works, the way we use our talents and gifts, these all speak to our devotion to Jesus. Friends, we are called to be living sacrifices. Romans 12.1 tells us, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What are you offering up today? Are you laying it all out there? Friends, we can be devoted to our families. We can be devoted to our hobbies. We can be devoted to our football teams. We can be devoted to our jobs, our coworkers. Whatever you can come up with, you can be completely devoted to it. But if you're not completely devoted to Christ, everything else will fail you. Everything else will crumble below your feet. I can say I'm a devout father, I'm a devout husband. But if I'm first not devout completely to Jesus, my devotion to my wife, I'm, I'm, I'm standing on sand. The only thing that can hold me up is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's right. And in this world that we live, things are getting thrown at you to be committed to this, be committed to that. Friends, it all begins with your walk with the Lord. 
He is the only one that will never fail you. He is the only one that will always keep his promises to you. He is the only one that is completely 100% committed to you. He's committed to you. He's devoted to you because he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus for you so that he could have a relationship with you. He wants that communion with you. He wants that relationship with you. The question is, how much do you want that relationship with him? Do you want it just as bad? Do you want that relationship with Jesus? Where is your devotion today? Don't let the world steal it away. Be a Mary. Whatever God's blessed you with, give it right back to God. Whatever talents and gifts he's given you, give it right back to the Lord. Let's not be a Judas. In our ways and our actions, everything we say and do in life, let's be sure it's not focused on selfish, evil intents. But rather, all we do and say, may it bring glory to God. Friends, He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is Emmanuel. Do you believe that today? Are you completely devoted to God? Friends, Mary showed her devotion. Judas judged her devotion, but Jesus approved it. If you want to be approved by God, show that complete devotion to him. That's what he wants. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. So today, won't you open up your hearts and your ears and hear from the Lord of what he wants to say? Maybe our priorities have gotten off and we need to renegotiate that and get the Lord at the very top of the list. Maybe our family needs to be up there committed to God. Maybe we need to spend less time doing this and that. Because friends, listen, one of the greatest excuses I hear when it comes to serving God is, I don't have time. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to serve him in this capacity. I don't have time to do this or do that. Time is valuable, obviously, in our world today. What if you committed all your time, devoted your time to God, and let him lead you in how to use your time wisely? He wants to know you. Don't you think he's going to help you find the time to meet with him daily? to help you find time to serve him in the church and use your spiritual gifts to serve him. If we're running out of time and God is just an itty bitty little minute part of it, if anything at all, we have a problem. Jesus wants your time. I'm not saying you're going to be sitting in the church all day long, 24-7. That's not what I'm saying. But if you start with the Lord everything else is going to fall into place the way it's supposed to be. So friends, let's be a Mary. Let's be at the feet of Jesus and crying out to him and showing our complete devotion. And may God touch our hearts and our minds if we're leading a life that is more like Judas than Mary today. Let's not be like Judas. Let's not be like Pharisees, but yet humble ourselves before the Lord and allow him to work in and through us every step of the way. Friends, do you want to know Jesus today? Do you want to be completely devoted to him? He loves you and that's what he wants. How about you? Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for your word and your truth. Lord, I, I'm so thankful that we're able to come to you personally to lift up our prayer request to you. Lord, I just lay out my heart to you today. God, knowing that myself, I've 
struggled with having time in this busy world, with having a family, with having a busy job, or finding the time to spend with you, the quality time. And Lord, I just want to present that to you, Lord, and give it over to you. And I pray, Lord, for our congregation here. Or if there's something that needs to change in their life, something they're struggling with, something they need to lay at your feet, something they need to give up to be completely devoted to you. God, my prayer today is that they would do that, that they would lay it at your feet, that they would come forward at this altar and do business with you before they leave. God, it's, it's all about you. It has nothing to do with us, but it, it, it's all about you and having a personal relationship with you. So Lord, won't you move in our hearts today? Overwhelm us with your spirit now. Let us know how much you love us, how much you want to know us, and help us to grow in our walk with you today. Lord, you're here waiting. It is us who needs to turn and move to you. Move in the hearts of our people today, God, and may you receive the glory and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you will, please stand. The invitation is now open. Listen to what the Lord has spoken to you today.